This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. It's an honor to um, introduce our speaker today, but before I do that, I really want to make special mention of the, the great work done by my colleague, Ellen Moody, that without her, this would not happen, because believe me, I was lazy. But, but yeah, it really speaks to her um, you know, en energy and the, the kind of spirit that she brings to the department. And I'm happy and honored to be her colleague, right? Um, well, it's an honor to uh, present Tom Belstorff, uh, who's professor of anthropology at UC Irvine and editor of the flagship of the fl flagship journal of the American Anthropological Association, American Anthropologist. Um, and to say that Tom is a dynamo and a force of nature is to downplay the magnitude of his achievements particularly his three elegantly and trenchantly argued books, and not to mention all the other editorial, um, edited volumes and um, uh, published essays. These three volumes include Coming of Age in Second Life, An Anthropologist Explores the Virtually Human, uh, published by Princeton University Press. The second book, A Coincidence of Desires, Anthropology, Queer Studies, Indonesia, published by Duke University Press, and The Gay Archipelago, Sexuality and Nation in Indonesia, published also by Princeton University Press. These three books take us to the gay shores of a Southeast Asian archipelago, to the conjunctive aspirations of two fields, anthropology and queer studies, to virtual worlds of avatars and second life. We are fortunate to have Tom here, to his former home grounds of the American heartland, being a native of Nebraska, um, and listen to him this afternoon amidst the hailstorm and rain to speak, to speak to us about new worlds and alternative forms of being and sociology, uh, sociality. And his talk today is entitled, Placing the Virtual Body, Avatar, Cora, and Cipher. Tom Belsor. Thank you so much, uh, Martin, and everyone for inviting me. I've always, the, I've always been a fan of the Urbana Department. It's such a wonderful anthropology department and such a wonderful campus, and so I'm so glad I finally get to be here. And um, I feel like I'm back in my old stopping, stomping grounds a bit. So let me explain what's going on in my life and what I'm going to do today in the 45 minutes or so that I'll talk. So for the last three years, and for a year and a half still to go, I'm editor-in-chief of American Anthropologists, which means I have no life. So I don't get to do any research, which I knew would happen. This is how my life is. Um, and I've published a few articles. I'm actually working on a book with three colleagues, Celia Pierce, T.L. Taylor, and Bonnie Nardi, called A Handbook of Anthropographic Methods for Virtual Worlds, because so many people ask us how you do this research. And we owe that manuscript to Princeton by April, so that's keeping me plenty busy as well. So what today's talk is, is sort of, while I'm too busy being an editor to do research, I get to think about ideas that I can do when in a year and a half I'm done and I get to start doing research again. This is a, ta a, a, ta this is a, a, a version of a piece that's coming out in a book next year called A Companion to the Anthropology of Embodiment that Fran Marshallis, a former editor of American Anthropologist, has put together. And she asked me to write a chapter about virtual embodiment, which is an issue that I'm interested in. And I use that as a chance to sort of think through some theoretical concepts and some philosophy in the Western tradition of embodiment and what might virtual worlds help us do in terms of thinking about questions of embodiment. That's why the title is such a mouthful, and I'll explain what all those terms mean in a bit. But first, even though there's not time, unfortunately, to do it in the way I would like to do it, but let me just show you, because not everyone, of course, knows what a virtual world is. Let me show you real quick what Second Life looks like. And because it's looking a little dark there, I think it'd be okay to cut the spotlight just for like 
three or four minutes, just real quick, because I, I don't have time to give you a full-on tour, but I just wanted to show people briefly sort of what a virtual world looks like. So here I am with my avatar body inside of Second Life. So a virtual world is different than a social networking site like Facebook, although they share some issue concepts and some, some aspects to them. Um, it's different than email. It's, you know, these different technologies have different affordances and different consequences, although they obviously share things as well. So Second Life is a three-dimensional virtual world. Here we are in my house that I built in Second Life. Um, I love building inside of Second Life. You can see the nice waterfall I put in it. And this is where I did a, where I did a lot of my interview, my field work in Second Life. I would have interviews and focus groups here. Um, you can even see, you know, and, and here I actually have for people who are interested in one room of my house, a virtual version of the first chapter of my book, Coming of Age in Second Life, which people could take for free. And you can actually open it and we're not getting sound here. Where you can actually open it and read the pages um, and, and uh, flip the pages and leave a bookmark or whatever and actually actually read it if you want to. Um, you'll see here I put, I put a, a nice little logo there to um, celebrate the fact that I'm here today. And, and in Second Life, you, can, um, you have an avatar body. You can actually have more than one, um, which you can change at will. So for instance, let me see if I can do this without crashing. So right now, this is my sort of default look. You can see I'm, I look, you know, I'm, I'm quite tan, quite buff there. With a, I got some tattoos on, um, but I could change my clothes. I could look like, you know, all kinds of um, things. So, for instance, if I want to look a little different, I can change my look here, and now you'll see me sort of changing in front of your eyes into a, a nice little uh, mechanical kitty cat. So now here I am as my little mechanical kitty cat, and I can run around and look like a kitty cat. I could look like a woman. I could look like a 50-foot tall monster. So here I am. Hi, everyone. There I am as the kitty cat, um, you know, looking at you. Or, um, you know, if I'm feeling in, let me see if I can pull this up. If I'm feeling like a, uh, let me see here feeling sort of in an ecological mood or whatever, I could uh, change my look again and decide that, you know, I feel today like I want to look like a giant sunflower person. And so I could do that. And here I am with my nice leafy head. Hi, everyone. Um, so I could, you can change your look at will. And inside of a virtual world like Second Life, you can also, I, I built this house. You can build things um, instantly, collaboratively with people inside the world. So here I just made that box. Um, and I can, you know, lift the box. This is how I built my house. I could move it around. I could make it into a circle. Um, I could rotate it, do anything I want. And anyone else who's with me right now could see that in real time. And I could move this box that I'm, even while I'm sitting on it, oops, that's part of my floor. I don't want to do that. I can move the um, a box around even with myself sitting on it. And if I created an object like clothing or a house, I could sell it for physical world money. So there's people who've made over a million dollars US selling things in Second Life. I purchased this avatar look that you see. So you can give things away for free in Second Life or sell them. And this piece of land that my house is on, you can see here I paid about $50 US from, and then there's a monthly fee based on how much land you own. But you can be in Second Life for free um, and just have an avatar and not build anything. Here I've been getting uh, sort of uh, having uh, fun in my uh, building. I've built this uh, sort of, it looks like a lighthouse that's in the process of falling over. Um, people do really creative, amazing stuff in Second Life that I just don't have time to show you, although I'll show you some images. But just to see, when I'm showing people Second Life like this, I don't like to talk to other avatars because it's weird for me ethically to be doing that with 100 people watching me behind my back. But just so you can see, this square of Second Life is called a sim, and this is my house. You can see me, I'm in part of my house. And if we step back, you'll, see, you'll start to see some green dots. And each of those green dots, there you start to see them, is someone who is somewhere in the world is logged into Second Life. And as we step back, you'll see there's about 70,000 people in Second Life right now. And it's a small virtual world compared to some of them. But you can see thousands and thousands of people that are inside Second Life right now. And I could have up to 40 of them um, in my house right now if I wanted to and have a, in, interview them, do whatever. And so the, the basic idea behind my research in this virtual world you know, linking it up to my research in Indonesia was that I was, as I was saying in my radio interview this morning with uh, WILL, if I'm in my room here in Second Life and I, there's someone who in the physical world is in Japan, in Germany, Australia, Nebraska, California, we're all sitting here and talking and some people might be falling in love, they might be building something together in another part of Second Life, having all kinds of social relationships, but they in most cases never meet in the physical world. They don't have to fly to Japan and to Germany and to Nebraska to understand 
understand the sociality that's happening here inside of Second Life. The sociality that's having, happening inside of Second Life has its own realness to it, and it's in, in influenced by the physical world cultures that people come from, but they don't have to meet in the physical world in order for them to hang out in my house in Second Life. So I followed that methodologically and did my research inside of Second Life using the exact same methods that I use in Indonesia. Participant observation, focus groups, I gave consent forms, I did it the exact same way that I did it in Indonesia with a few interesting changes um, to do that research. And so if there's more time in the Q&A, I can show you more uh, of Second Life, but um, I just don't have time to, to show you a lot of it to, today, but I just wanted to give you a, a basic background about what a virtual body is, um, like this avatar body in Second Life, and what a, a virtual like Second Life is like. And here you can see some of my neighbor's houses. You know, here my neighbor across the way has a very nice sort of waterfall house going on. You know, IBM is in Second Life, lots of companies, universities, there's people all over the world, there's huge areas of it that are all Portuguese speaking because of Brazilians or Chinese, Japanese. Um, once again, if we have more time later, I can give you more of a, of a guided tour. Um, but for now, I, I need to, I'll, I'll go to the talk. So that's just a very quick sort of heads up as to how it, how it works. Um, so you don't, now um, you can bring up the spotlight if you want, you don't really need to, but it's, it's your, cho uh, your choice on that. So this is the talk that I'm gonna give you today. Once again, because I don't have time in my life right now to be doing active research because I'm editor of the biggest anthropology journal in the world, which is awesome, but that's the price you pay. So I get to think through theoretically some of the issues that have come up in my research, and that's what I'm going to be doing to, today and talking about this. So this is my talk that you're going to be hearing today. Here is my 40-minute talk. In fact, I'll have to skip through parts of it, but probably we'll see. So let's begin by sort of looking at some basic framing questions, building off of the research that I've done so far and sort of moving, moving it forward. So what does it mean to have a body? And how might virtual worlds and these sort of online socialities transform how we understand the body in online worlds, but also in the physical world as well? Because I'm always very interested as to what we can learn about the, our physical world lives from virtual worlds, ways that they teach us that our lives have always been virtual in a certain sense. And so that's what I mean by saying, how might they sort of recall us to sort of long-standing notions of embodiment? And the key point that I'm going to try and make today that has really come out of my earlier research that I'm now trying to push further is that virtual embodiment is always embodiment in a virtual place. That's what makes virtual worlds different than a social networking site like Facebook or email or something like that is this placeness of, of virtual worlds. And I'm going to risk myself in this talk to try and make some interesting claims and to sort of push things, and this is provisional, this is a work in progress, a, a part of a broader project, that I want to sort of think about what are the consequences of this fact of virtual embodiment it being embodiment in a virtual place, and the pluralization of place, now that there's ju not just the physical world, but virtual worlds as well, what does that mean for the body and for corporal corporeality? How does that affect those things? And I'm going to try and sort of defamiliarize the Western tradition that has been so influential in the creation of virtual worlds, which most, mostly come out of Silicon Valley and places like that, and to think about how virtual worlds might help us think about other possibilities as well. And rather than try to sort of make these binarisms that we often work through about mind versus body or nature and culture go away, for decades people try and make them go away and they seem to keep coming back. And we can talk later about the sort of uh, failures of post-structuralism if we want to. Instead, what I want to do is add another binarism to sort of mix it up, um, thinking about the difference or the relationship between the virtual and the actual. And through that, I'm going to bring out these three new concepts in my very wordy title for my talk today, and I'll explain what these are, the virtual Cora, being in world, and the cypherg. And by the end of the talk, I want to suggest that the theory of virtual embodiment I'm bringing up gives us a whole new way of thinking about the digital. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on around digital media, digital anthropology, digital this, digital that, and I can never figure out what the hell it means. Often it just seems to mean that you plug it in. 
But even if it's analog, people still want to study it. So I, I, I actually don't really understand what digital means in many of these cases, except that somehow it has electricity. And I don't think that's a, su a sufficient or, or sufficiently interesting use of the notion of digital. I want to try and push it even further. But of course, given the time in which I'm giving this talk in 2010, there's no way I can start without mentioning the film Avatar. James Cameron's given us a whole lot of big name movies. Just in case any of you have never seen Avatar, here's like a one minute reminder of what Avatar is. Pay attention to this, it's very theoretically significant, the way that he's using that wheelchair and that robot arm. That will be very theoretically significant. So and, uh, you may not have heard, but um, he's, uh, uh, Cameron just announced plans for the next two Avatar movies are going to be going into production soon. So this was written and directed by James Ca Cameron and employing these really fancy special effects. First released in December 2009, it has now become the highest grossing work of artistic creation by any human being in the history of the human race. It's made almost $3 billion. So more than any other object, sculpture, painting, film, anything, this has made more than any other cultural production ever. Now, the plot for which Cameron insisted on sole credit recalls, or a less generous verb would be derivative of, um, plots from Pocahontas to Dances with Wolves. In fact, one of my favorite names for this movie is Dances with Smurfs. Um, in its tale of this native race that's threatened by a technologically advanced colonizer, um, and it's saved only when the protagonist, Jake, um, a Scully, a member of the colonizers, turns against um, his own people and sort of goes native, so to speak. Now, uh, Cameron, while he in, in interviews, explicitly does link this to indigenous politics, which is really fascinating. For the movie itself, he allegorizes this colonial conflict, putting Avatar in the future in the year 2154 and locating its humans, the humanoid natives, these blue folks, the Navi, on this moon, Pandora, in the Alpha Centauri star system. And you don't need to know all the details, but the basic idea is that the humans have come here to this beautiful place because they're seeking this rare metal that's worth a lot of money, so it's like a mining kind of corporate capitalism kind of thing. And um, the Navi are sort of an irritation because they're going to have to be relocated to be able to get this, um, get this metal, but it's a significant enough irritation that the corporation has created these avatars, these um, artificially grown bodies that look native but are actually human Navi hybrids. And each can only be controlled by the person who, whose DNA has been used to make them, or an identical twin of that person. In the story, he's actually an identical twin. And they control the avatars by sort of lying in this special bed and getting hooked up to the thing, and then you, then you control the avatars. And because the atmosphere of this moon, Pandora, is toxic to humans, the only way that humans can exist on this planet is either by using these avatars or by wearing those big robot bodies. And I said that will be significant in the, uh, later on, that those are the only two options that they have. 
Now, in three ways, the movie is actually surprisingly conservative in the way it talks about the virtual body, and it's very different than Second Life, actually. First, it assumes this isomorphism between the physical, the physical body and the virtual body. Um, and this is, so pe people look like their avatars, right? Sully sort of looks like his avatar. Sigourney Weaver's avatar looks like her. So you can't like pretend to be someone else, right? We never see some plot twist where someone else controls Sigourney Weaver's blue smurf, right? That doesn't happen. Um, also, the, in, in this movie, if you kill one of the blue avatars, you, the person doesn't die. So the fears of death only apply to the human body. And this is a real contrast between Avatar and one of the best known movies that appeared before it about virtual worlds, The Matrix, which is actually a source of a lot of confusion about virtual worlds because there you use them to enslave the human race. And you know any technology can be used for bad things, but it's not quite so clear cut that virtual worlds are going to ruin, ruin everything. Um, and so that's a second difference. And a third obvious difference is that in the movie Avatar, the avatars aren't online, like I just showed you with Second Life. So they're not really virtual. Even though he's using the word av avatar, they're not really virtual. And in fact, the sort of, I'm going to give it away since it's the biggest film in human history, that you know, one of the big things that happens at the end, close your ears if you don't want to hear, is when Jake is able to sort of go into his blue body and allow his human body to, to, to die, which is sort of the ultimate act of going native. It's linked to fantasies of settler, settler colonial um, and that's possible because unlike something like Second Life, which is what I'm going to talk about today, here the thing is physical. So in many ways, this, uh, this movie is really misleading. But there's one interesting way in which it was absolutely right in the way that it thought about the virtual body, and I will mention that later. But these are some ways in which it actually is not so helpful and actually can cause a lot of confusion. So what I want to do now to clarify things is explain what I'm talking about in terms of virtual bodies, which is the way that in all of these new virtual worlds that are showing up, you know, there are hundreds of millions of people participating in virtual worlds. Seven out of the 10 biggest ones are for children. They're really becoming part of our, of our online ecology. I want to talk about how avatars work in a virtual world like Second Life. So that's what I want to talk about now is something that's a little dim for you to see, but there's me flying over part of Second Life and my avatar. So now I want to talk about virtual worlds, not the movie, but virtual worlds, and this idea of being what, being in world. What I'm going to talk about is about, about being in world. So as I mentioned before, you can enter Second Life for free and then once you're there you have this avatar and you can move around all these landscapes that people have created and that's so dim you can barely even see. It doesn't really matter. Just so, showing you a few pictures. This is inside the Second Life. This is not a physical world photo. This is inside the Second Life, a sort of country, village, you know, Midwestern town that some people have created. I mean, you can just create all kinds of fascinating environments inside of Second Life, and, and there's just an incredible amount of sort of creativity in, what ter in terms of what people have done inside of all of these virtual worlds, including Second Life. There's, there's many others um, in, in addition to Second Life. And often these landscapes have a kind of rural countryside feel to them. And people who are new to Second Life often say it feels sort of abandoned, like, where is everyone? I was expecting World of Warcraft and all these things for me to shoot. Um, and I want to actually, there, there's some technical reasons for that, but I actually think there's an interesting philosophical, partial at least, reason behind this emphasis on the landscape. And, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But now, of course, in addition, oh, and here's like a Vegas kind of look. This is also not in the physical world. This is inside of Second Life. Um, <clears throat> just to show you a quick example, um, just to think about the body in Second Life, here's a case where Sims, some people got together to recreate a geisha dance inside of Second Life. Think about the relationship here between the body and the landscape and place. It's absolutely fascinating. So this is inside of Second Life.
look, here's someone, there's a giant dog sitting in the audience. Like it all looks so realistic and then you look and there's like someone who's like a giant dog sitting in the audience enjoying the show. <laughs> I won't show the whole thing. To give you a, a taste of that. And actually, another thing that people often do in Second Life is go to dances. There's a lot of dancing and dance clubs that happen in Second Life. And here's a bunch of people. I spent a lot of time on the dance floor doing my research in, in Second Life. It was awesome. Um, but remember this image of people dancing on a dance floor, all these avatars dancing on a dance floor. It will also prove to be theoretically significant. So um, this is actually a meeting at the Transgender Resource Center for people who are thinking about changing their gender in the physical world, and they live as the other gender inside of Second Life to see how they like that. Um, to, and, and, and there are people who are in this organization, um, people I know who actually feel that their Second Life avatar is more real than their physical body, because it's more in line with how they see their gender identity. So, um, Obviously, this idea of the avatar is very important, and avatars can appear as any ethnicity, any gender. They can look like an animal. They can do all kinds of things. Often, they do reflect physical world notions of beauty and status, but not always. There's plenty of uh, avatar looks that don't just do that. There's physically disabled people who, in Second Life, have avatars with wheelchairs, like the wheelies group, because they feel that's part of their body, and they want to have that inside of Second Life as well. Um, and so you've just got this incredible flexibility of avatar embodiment. So, you know, you can't do this in the physical world where you could change your clothes, but in the physical world, you couldn't just click a button and change your race, right? And immediately look like a different race. That's something that's not doable in the physical world. And not everything about virtual worlds is new, but um, some of them, some of them are. The fact that they're changeable and that you can have more than one avatar body, you can have more than one account um, inside of Second Life, all of those kinds of things. And just to show you, you know, here's my default look I just showed you in Second Life. And just to show you just a few of the avatar looks that I have inside of Second Life, there's my kitty that I showed you. Um, there I'm a dollar from Doctor Who. Um, there I'm a sort of elf, you can't really see me very well. There I'm a kind of sea dragon kind of thing. I just sort of liked it. Here I'm a female jellyfish person. Here I'm a kind of living tree, once again it's a little dim. If all three bulbs aren't on, can you make sure they're on? Because it's a little dim. Um, here I am as my uh, little daisy person. Here I am as like a cartoon cat. Um, here I am as a little baby penguin with a little popsicle. You can't quite see it there. Um, here I am as a Japanese anime character. Halloween is awesome in Second Life. It was just Halloween because like you go to parties and what you see just blows you away. Here I am as a giant tree and then here I am as a 200 foot tall dragon um, with giant wingspans. That's an awesome avatar look. But yeah, if you can turn up the brightness just a bit, that'd be great. It's not crucial. Now, not everyone makes use of all these possibilities inside of Second Life, but, but many people do. And um, just to give you a couple examples, because once again, I, I only want to try and go for like another 20, 25 minutes, is to just tell you a couple quick stories of examples of interesting things that happen in Second Life around avatars and the virtual body. Although a lot of what happens in Second Life is very mundane, and as an anthropologist, I'm actually more interested, frankly, in the mundane, but sometimes the extraordinary can be interesting as well. And these two stories are ones that Second Life journalists have told, and so they're unusual stories that actually depend on knowing something about the physical world life of, of the people in question. But they, they, they sort of point up some interesting possibilities, just to mention them. So here's one of the story of Sci Fishy Traveler. So he's in Second Life and, and had just had a breakup in the physical world and decided that he would create a female avatar who he named Beginning Tuesday because he created her on Tuesday um, to sort of keep him company. And sometimes he would open up the Second Life program. It's like opening Microsoft Word or a program twice so he could have them both online at the same time. And he says one day feeling upset about his lost romance, he moved Sci Fishy up to Beginning and as he says, offered myself a hug. At that moment, something shifted, as he puts it, so he did the next logical thing. We started dating. The romance continued an instant message. I talked to myself. Tell me the things I secretly wished a lover would tell me. Assure myself I'm beautiful and loved. It's become a means to explore how to give myself the kind of love I was seeking from outside of myself before, which is a fascinating turn of phrase. But one last thing to note, in the physical world, Sci Fishy is actually female. I had shifted genders as an experiment, she says, Sci Fishy, I will now reveal, who as it turns out is just another case of a woman imagining herself as a man imagining himself partnered to another woman who's really herself. 
That is something you couldn't have happen in the physical world. Or another exa uh, example, oops, that I'll mention, oh wait, I'm pushing buttons in the wrong way here. Another example that I'll just mention very briefly um, is a case of Eshi here. Um, here is her avatar in Second Life, and her physical world husband died suddenly, very tragically, and she created a look for her avatar to look like her dead husband and took him around in Second Life and took him skydiving and doing all kinds of things that he had always wanted to do, but she never was willing to log herself and him on at the same time, at least at the time that she was interviewed. She just thought that would be too, too stressful. Um, so it's just another interesting example of the kinds of things that you can do. But these are both extraordinary stories, and in my own research, of course, I'm interested also in the sort of mundane, everyday uses of virtual worlds for embodiment and what they tell us. So I've just done just a whirlwind, quick ideas around avatars and around Second Life, and I'm so sorry I don't have time to do more. You know, we can try and do more in the Q&A, but I really want to move into the conceptual part of the talk because that's what I get to think about nowadays while I'm an editor. So I want to get up to this part here and get to some of the theoretical stuff where I'm trying to take what I've done in my book and in other articles I've written and just push it as far as it will go to think about what is really happening with these, this virtual body stuff. What can it, what can it teach us about, about ideas around, um, around embodiments? Now, Theories of embodiment I could give a whole talk on, and I won't even bother doing that. I mean, the, they, they go link up to all kinds of things. I mean, the term avatar obviously comes from Hindu religion, um, referring to the incarnation of a, of a Hindu deity. And there's been a lot of work on embodiment coming out of feminist theory and anthropology in so many different areas. There's been a lot of really interesting um, work around embodiment. And embodiment actually turns out to be very important to the way in which virtual worlds are actually created. In my opinion, the first true virtual world, as I would define it here, um, was created in 1970 and it was called Video Place in Maryland. And this guy, Myron Kruger, was in a room in, on the college campus with this new fancy technology called a camera, and he had a monitor, and he actually had two monitors, one to be able to talk to a colleague across campus, and the other to look at these waveforms. And the two of them were talking on the phone and trying to describe these waveforms to each other and having trouble explaining by him pointing at one and the friend to point at the other. And then he had this kind of aha moment where he told his friend, hey, Let's turn these cameras not on us, but on the screens, and we'll superimpose our two hands and the two waveforms. We'll be able to see what we're doing. Can you see how that's easy? that would be easier for them than this up here, these two things? So he did that, and then Myron describes this moment in 1970 when he was doing this, and he moved his finger up to show something, and the friend jerked his hand back like he was afraid he was going to get touched. And he actually experimented with it. He kept trying to touch his friend's hand. And he talks about he had this eureka moment where he realized this, un unlike this up here, this is a place. This is a virtual place. That's why he eventually called the thing he made from it video place. He said this is a place, and it was around embodiment, and these two hands touching. Play, pay very close attention to these two hands with their fingers touching. That is extremely important. I know it sounds crazy, but it is extremely important that there are two hands pointing at each other here. I swear to God, this is going to be incredibly theoretically important later. And this was the moment when he sort of realized it was possible. And actually, in his book about this, he tried to imagine what a virtual world might look like 10, 20, 30 years later. He called it a mega environment. And, you know, it doesn't look like Second Life or whatever. But notice how important bodies are to it. Right from the beginning, avatars, the idea of virtual bodies, but in a place. In a place. The co uh, combination of body and place turned out to be extremely important even from the very beginning of virtual worlds. So to link this now to some um, points that I make in some of my, in my earlier research, there are two key points that really t came out for me, for me in doing my, my early research. One is the, this incredible importance of place, that everyone wanted to ask me about sex and money and people being men who are women and vice versa, and is it addictive? And you know, there are these common questions everyone wants to know. But the more time I spent in Second Life, the more interested I got in these very basic issues around place and time. And then also, the idea, you even saw me just now building stuff inside of Second Life, the notion of crafting, um, which, uh, of techne, um, 
is a really interesting way versus episteme to think about human being in virtual worlds. And, and briefly, Greek thought dif differentiated episteme, knowledge, from techne, which is the root of technology. And actually, because I'm going to talk about philosophy, Heidegger talks about techne as meaning to make something appear, he says, within what is present as this or that, in this way or that way. And that turn of phrase is very interesting because it in introduces what a linguist would call an indexical relationship, a relationship of pointing. And this underscores how techne, the key thing about technology it te and techne is it makes a gap between the, world, the way the world was before and after. So one um, philosopher talks about it as an example, the way that if you make a tube, that humans can't breathe underwater, but you can make like a tube and then humans can breathe underwater. And that creates a new ability that wasn't there before um, the creation of that techne, before the ability of that craft. And in my broader project, I talk about how, in, I mean, I don't have time to go into it, but in the, in the Western tradition, what we do as social scientists or anthropologists is create episteme, create knowledge. That goes back to the theory, to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You can see that image on the front of my computer, and your computer's up there, the apple with the bite out of it, right? That the origin story of techne in Greek mythology is Prometheus giving fire to humans. In the original myth, it's actually not fire alone. It's fire and techne is what the original texts say. Craft is the special gift given to humans. And I try and think about how might anthropology work differently if we actually worked to create techne um, in terms of what we do. So, um, oh wait, let me finish something up here. Um, and so one thing that if I was gonna say what makes virtual worlds distinctive, and there's some things that, make, that are different about them. One is that for the first time, there's an interesting way in which techne becomes recursive. So in the physical world, you can use craft, your ability to craft, to turn wood and ideas into a chair. The idea of a chair plus wood into, chair, into a chair. But techne doesn't just turn silicon and ideas and computers into a virtual world. Techne can also take place inside of the virtual world, like inside of the chair almost. And this has really interesting consequences that I won't have time to go into now, but these are some ideas that I've already been spinning around from before. Now I'm going to take you somewhere else where my earlier work does not go. I want to now link techne with another concept from ancient Greek philosophy, Korah which is best known from its appearance in Timaeus, one of uh, the late the dialogues of Plato. And philosophers, and I'm not one of them, have debated this term for over 2,000 years. But um, most people, philosophers, would define it as this idea that it's the basis of being that things come to be in it without being of it. And examples that Plato gave was like the odorless oil that you need in order to make a perfume or the wax that you make an image, but the, the wax that makes the image possible is Cora. So it's this fascinating sort of philosophical concept that comes from very early thought about this idea of uh, the, the potential of being is, is sort of Cora. So one um, uh, example of it is um, that comes from Plato. He, would, he said that, um, for instance, if you take a mass of gold and you can make it into a triangle and other kinds of things, if someone were to ask what it is, the safest answer would be that it's gold. But as for the triangle and the things that you make from it, one should avoid speaking of them as being, since they're changing even while you're speaking. The gold is an image of that which receives the images. And is, that is what we would call Korah. Now, one way to think about this relationship of um, idea and Korah and things, like you have the idea, and then you have like the gold, the sort of potentiality, and then you have the thing you make from it, is as father, mother, and child. And one historical use of Korah was to mean sort of receptacle or even a surrogate mother. And, and people like Derrida or Liz, Grossman, uh, Liz Gross and other people have used this um, to think about the idea of core and link it up to feminist theory, and they've done really fascinating work. But even people like Liz Gross admit that that's not the original meaning of Korah. And I want to go way back to the beginning and, and look at the very original idea of what Korah meant. So elsewhere in Plato and in early Greek thought, Korah meant something like landscape or country. So you get things in early Greek thought where people would say things like, Crete is not a level Korah, right? So Korah means something like landscape. 
right? It means something like place or landscape. And it's often opposed in Greek thought to the city, to polis is one, is one thing. So it means something like landscape or land or country or even a shared space or common visual field. Think about looking at Second Life, right? And it is actually one of the oldest words for place in Greek thought. It goes all the way back to Homer. And this is why I was saying that rural feel of, uh, that you get from Second Life may not just be about server load, but it's also this interesting link to landscape and place. And if you go even further back, all the way back to the Iliad, it actually means um, a dance and a dancing floor. And scholars of that period talk about how way back then we got a kind of emerging recognition that a precondition for activity, to have a body, to do something, is to have a place for it to occur. Just like dancing requires a dancing floor. That's why I mentioned that image earlier. So we can actually, in fact, one of the only ways that term chorus shows up in modern English is the idea of choreography. Right? It's about place and bodies and the relationship between place and body, which I just think is so awesome. It's so interesting. And I don't have time to go into it now, but actually, unlike the word like topos in Greek, kora means meaningful place. I could give you an example later if there's time. But this idea of the dancing floor, I just think is, is, is absolutely fascinating. And just think of the, dan the clip I just showed you of the ja da uh, Japanese dance, right? It's awesome. You see all these things coming together, which is just so fascinating to me. So how might we think of Korra as a kind of choreography of techne with place, right? The way that virtual worlds allow us to create this new sort of dance of embodiments. And actually, one Plato scholar writing in 1985 wrote that if Plato had lived into the 1970s or 1980s, instead of gold, that example I just gave you, he might have chosen a movie screen or a television screen as his way of explaining what Cora was. An analog, he says, to a field across which ceasingly changing images may flicker. And I would contend that if Plato was alive now in 2010, he might have picked not a movie screen, but a virtual world as a great way to illustrate the idea of, Cor of Cora. And virtual worlds actually help us see how that what's at issue here isn't just place, but place making. The sort of embodied dance of crafting, of techne, with this kind of being in the world. And by even using, obviously, that term, being in the world, you can see where I'm pushing myself now to sort of link up to phenomenology and the ideas around the phenomenology of the body. So, I want to say that there is more to, virtu to the virtual body than just avatars. It's about embodiment in a place. And in virtual world studies, and even in everyday life in virtual worlds, there's this new term where people talk about being in world. Um, that I'm in world right now, or I'm going to log off. And what I do in the longer version of this paper, which I, don't, I won't obviously go into now, is what happens if we take this idea of being in the world, which is crucial to phenomenology, that the idea that embodiment is always um, being in the world, like a dancer on a dance floor. That embodiment is always emplacement. And in the broad, longer version of this paper, I bring up a lot of phenomenological work to sort of show this and to sort of bring this out. Um, this idea I'm talking about now, about being in world, when there's now more than one world to be in. Right? And actually, as one phenomenological scholar talks about, about how the body can no longer be regarded as an entity to be examined in its own right, but has to be placed in the context of a world. And what's so interesting to me about virtual worlds is that now the worlding becomes pluralized in a really interesting way. And this pluralization of worlding, to me, underscores how virtual embodiment needs to obviously be looked at in terms of the specific way it shows up in specific virtual world contexts, because they differ. And then, of course, there are also interesting ways in which they link up. And Merleau-Ponty has really interesting stuff on ideas of the flesh that I'm not going to go into now about virtual flesh. But this is the big thing that that movie Avatar got right, was that the avatars were on Pandora, that it saw that emplacement is, is essential to embodiment. And given the fact that I'm playing around with Greek thought, it's so awesome that he decided to name the planet Pandora, right? He also went back to early Greek thought. Um, and Pandora, I mean, what an interesting figure, right? This all-giving first woman who brought evil, but in many of the story versions of the myth also brought good um, into the world, is just a fascinating um, an interesting link up to that, to that issue. And actually, 
as I mentioned to you earlier, I wanted you to really pay attention to that um, there are two ways to embody, to have a, a body on Pandora. You either have to like wear one of these big suits or like the mask kind of thing, or you, you go into the tank thing and like control one of these blue bodies. And that's actually a really awesome way to differentiate the difference between the avatar and the cyborg, which is a well-known figure from Donna Haraway's work and other people's work in science and technology studies. So in, in distinction to an even earlier concept, the android, right, like data from Star Trek The Next Generation, the cyborg is part human and part machine. It's predicated on relationships of interpenetration and attachment, like a prosthetic relationship between an arm or the remains of an arm and then a cyborg arm, right, which a machine arm would be that would be put on it. So it's based on the idea of attachment. But the, in contrast, an avatar is not predicated on attachments. It's predicated on a gap. Remember, I keep coming back to this idea of a gap. There's a clear gap between Jake's physical world body and his avatar body. I am not my second life body. There's an interesting gap between the two. That's very different than the idea of the cyborg, where it's all about things getting mixed together in a really interesting, in a really interesting way. And I won't have time to go into this in detail, but there's a lot of interesting um, work on, in, in phenomenology on the idea of dwelling. That, as Heidegger talks about it, to be human means to be on Earth as a mortal. It means to dwell. And there's really fascinating work in phenomenology on this idea of dwelling. And it's not coincidental, I think, that even that very early wor uh, world video place and many other, like think of World of Warcraft, all of these places, uh, many of them, even when they don't have it in their name, emphasis emphasize this idea of virtual dwelling, of dwelling in a virtual place. So the real t one of the real take home points I'm trying to push here is that embodiment is always about a kind of emplacement. And what makes virtual worlds interesting is not just that I can be a cool dragon or a woman or whatever, although that's all really interesting, but that the virtual body is in a virtual place. And that relationship between place and body is a fascinating area for further research. And as you can see from this whole talk, I'm really pushing myself here to be in a question space. I'm really thinking about what my, I research in a year and a half when I'm not editor anymore in terms of what might be some interesting things I myself could do to think about this relationship between place and body because I think getting a better understanding on the, of this could also help us think about embodiment in the physical world. I think that's a great way that we could actually use virtual worlds to think in new ways about the physical world. So now I just have two, I'm, I'm, I'm coming up towards the end. I know I'm throwing a lot at you out here and we can talk more about it later, but this is my life right now. I get to think these thoughts because I don't have time to do research. So now I want to push this in a whole, even further, to think about this idea of the relationship between a body and place, right? That's what I'm talking about here now, hopping around, in terms of indexicality. Remember, I mentioned Heidegger earlier about this idea of being in the world as being sort of in this place or that. Right, as Heidegger said, C.S. Peirce, a lot of other people talk about that. And uh, as a linguist, we would call, I'm, I was originally trained as a linguist, we call this an indexical relationship because it, it's pointing at something, right? The meaning of the word chair has a certain meaning. The meaning of the word this or that doesn't have any meaning outside of a particular context of pointing. And, and, and linguists call these deictic or indexical um, uh, terms. And Heidegger emphasized this relation of pointing that lies behind the mutually constitutive being of body and world. And this is this idea, that to me, what's so interesting about this is that um, it, it's based on indexical uh, uh, relationships. And obviously, well, not obviously, but this relationship of pointing, an indexical relationship, I mean, that comes from the word for the index finger, right? Because an indexical, I was just doing it without even thinking about it, right? That means an indexical relationship. And the word digital originates from the term digit. So this is where I want to think about digital in a new way, not just about it being something you plug in, but digital media or digital anthropology, digital whatever, as being about relationships of pointing, of digits. Think back to that image from video place of the two fingers pointing at each other. That's why that to me was so fascinating, even at that early stage, was this idea of indexical relationships between body and place as playing a crucial role in what the virtual body means. And 
in my prior work, I've talked about how the, the gap between the virtual and the actual is extremely important. And you just saw that in the way that I differentiate the cyborg from the avatar. And this goes back to the, uh, to the idea of digital code versus analog, is that it's zeros and ones, right? There's a gap between the zero and one. Computers can't work without gaps. They need the gap between zero and one. That's what digital originally means in computer coding, as opposed to the analog kind of way of recording data. And this is also like the gap between fingers, right? This, this notion of a gap um, and this pointing relationship. This gives us a, an idea of a relation of pointing that draws together digital and indexical in, in really fascinating ways to me. And this allows then, because I mentioned earlier that one of the unique things about virtual worlds is that you can craft inside of them, it allows this pointing, this indexical relationship to become recursive. It allows virtual embodiment to be digital in the sense that it allows the digital to point at itself. And I, I love comparing this image from the Sistine Chapel, right, of the creation of man, right, the creation of Adam by God, where God is using the finger and the pointing relationship. But if you look closely at the image, the fingers don't touch, right, because God and man are separate. That distinction between the two fingers, that gap, is extremely theoretically significant in this tradition to thinking about the body and creation and crafting and techne. And it's fascinating to compare that with the image I just showed before of the pointing relationship that goes back to the very early days of virtual worlds. But what's so fascinating to me here, without even meaning to do it, here we don't have God versus man. Here we have two humans of equal status. And so the fingers don't have the same power relationship of the strong pointing hand and this kind of limp you know, person being created. Instead, you have mutual constitution. The two fingers are pointing at each other and creating each other and creating place through that pointing relationship. So to me, it recalls not so much Michelangelo, but M.C. Escher. Right? This relationship of constitutive pointing that brings into world, like dancing brings a dance floor into being, this choreography or choreography of the body, of the virtual body in this case, that can bring these things into being. That it allows it to point at itself in this way. And so this is something that I'm interested in thinking through in more detail in, term, in my future research about what this might mean for embodiment. And then the last of the sort of crazy terms, and I've just got about four minutes left to go and then I'll be done, and then we'll have a little time for Q&A, or I can show you more Second Life if there's time or whatever you want to see. I found it helpful to turn to another phenomenologist, Carl Jaspers, um, who's a sort of underrated phenomenologist in my opinion. And he has this interesting idea that he talks about of the cipher. And the cipher for him, um, is, I mean, he has all these philosophical definitions of it, but he basically means it as, he calls it an objectivity permeated by subjectivity in such a way that being becomes present in the whole. Now, the word cipher comes from the Arabic word for zero, right? The binary zero to the pointing one, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a digital concept. And, which, and cipher, the, the, the original term cipher, actually means a symbol that has no value by itself, but only gains its value based on, to the, based on the things that it points to. So for instance, if you add, because it means zero, if you think of 10, 100, 1,000, 100,000, those zeros don't have any meaning in and of themselves. Their meaning comes from what they're next to, from what they point to, right? They have this kind of indexical relationship. And he talks about this idea of the world of the ciphers in his broader, broader project, which I don't have time to go into here. But I would like to play around with this idea, not so much of the cyborg, because as I mentioned earlier, this is not about cyborgs at all. Avatars are quite different. But one way to play around with it might, might be not the cyborg, but the cypherg as the kind of avatar subject of these in-world virtual places. This, to me, is a really interesting place that I want to think through theoretically but also ethnographically in my future research about this relationship between signification, particularly indexical, not symbolic, but indexical signification, embodiment, and place. And that this idea of, the recursive, in, uh, of recursive indexicality is to sort of make a pun on it, the sort of point of the virtual body itself. And I think, to conclude, that 
in addition to learning about the, virtual, about the virtual body itself, I think this might open up interesting avenues of inquiry to think about physical world bodies, to think about, as, as, um, as Vivieros de Castro puts it in his sort of trying to destabilize Western notions of embodiment, he notes, for instance, that the Amerindian emphasis on the social construction of the body cannot be taken as the culturalization of a natural base as it is in the West, but rather as the production of a distinctly human body, meaning naturally human, which is just fascinating. And, and the work of people like Vivieros de Castro helps me think about the, that there, uh, as one way of thinking about these sort of alternative genealogies of virtual embodiments, that the kind of theoretical work that I'm trying to do here, and also ethnographic as well, might give us to think about the relationship between the physical world body and its emplacement in the field site, right, that we anthropologists study, and to think through what new possibilities might exist for embodiment when it is not just culture that can be multiple, because we're anthropologists have been doing that for over 100 years. Multiculturalism, we talk about multiplicity in terms of culture, but what might be at stake when the world becomes multiple as well. What are some possibilities that that might raise is once again an area that I'm really interested in thinking, thinking through in more detail. I always close with these slides because people often ask me about what is the future gonna bring and I wish I had a time machine but I don't. We don't I don't get to study the future. This is the McDonald's webpage from 1996. I think they paid like, you know, $5 million to have the best minds at the time design it. I mean, that is high tech. Look, you could click on the golden arches. Isn't that awesome? That's from 1996. This is Twitter. Now, Twitter is actually, or Facebook, is actually very simple. It's just a little text, right? Little streams of text. You could do it with a dial-up modem. You could do it with a very old computer that didn't work very well. There is no reason that we couldn't have had Twitter at this point in time in 1996, or Facebook. They're actually very simple, much simpler than Second Life. The reason that we didn't have Twitter in 1996 was not a failure of technology. It was a failure of imagination. We could not imagine what would be possible with this new technology called the internet and called web pages and all that kind of thing. And I think that obviously virtual worlds right now are like this McDonald's web page, even the stuff I showed you in Second Life, that we can't even imagine what might be possible with virtual worlds in the future. And uh, obviously we can't, I can only research the present and the past, so I can't tell you. But what I've tried to do today, just by thinking through, pushing myself as hard as I can to think theoretically about what does it mean to have a virtual body, might give me some ways to think about designing future research that will help me get a handle on how these fascinating new spaces of, of, of human existence, uh, what they might hold. Because I think at stake is nothing less than the notion of the digital Digital, but also our questions of future relationship to technology. And I have a little clip that if there's time later I could show that raises some of these questions, but I won't do that now. I'll just stop for the moment, and then if there's time I can always show it. So thank you so much for that, and let's have some uh, uh, questions or discussion. <laughs> It's really dark back there, so yeah. Excellent talk, I enjoyed that very much. I'm 1,000% on your side, and I wanna push you a little bit further. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so three examples, and I wanna say, uh, I wanna hear what you say about the place in these examples. Um, um, one of them is the Microsoft Connect, just because this just came out, um, where there's a kind of mirroring between what the physical body is doing and what's happening in the virtual world. Oh, the new game, is, the Connect, yeah, the yeah. KON Connect thing, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so first <clears> example. Um, second example is, I'm not exactly sure why you wanna say that Facebook is not a place. Um, <clears throat> When my little green dot appears in Facebook chat, it tells everyone that I'm in world. Um, um, so the third example is uh, all of the avatars you had have very distinct, uh, they're all individuals, in other words. They all have distinct uh, boundaries of their body. Um, and this certainly isn't necessary in uh, virtual worlds. So I'm thinking of not World of Warcraft, but I'm thinking of something like Starcraft, where I don't have a single body that I'm in, but I'm sort of distributed among all the different units that I'm controlling in this game. Um, and so that makes embodiment look much different than the sort of Second Life 
uh, mm -hmm. examples you're giving. So I wonder what you can say about those examples. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, quick answers on all those three things. Connect is like this new version of the Wii almost that Microsoft has where there's like a camera on you, you sort of go like this and then the person moves. And it'll be interesting to see what that, it doesn't, re it isn't directly related to the question of virtual worlds as such, but it will, there have already been experiments in using those kinds of things to control avatars in virtual worlds. And it's very interesting that Linden Lab, the company that created Second Life and runs Second Life, actually started out as a company trying to create haptic technologies. And, and haptic technologies meaning precisely those kind of embodied technologies. And they actually created Second Life as a kind of demonstration platform to demonstrate their haptic technologies in the early 2000s, which is like hundreds of years ago with this stuff, and realized that their haptic technologies actually sucked, but the thing they had made to demonstrate them was awesome. So they actually shifted into the virtual world. So there's interesting connections there. In terms of Facebook, I would like to be quite strict that Facebook is not a place. It is not helpful conceptually to conflate everything with each other. And social networks and virtual worlds are different. But when you get group chat on, on Facebook, where you have the green dot, and especially once you get multiple people chatting, that is basically becoming like a mud, like an early virtual world inside of it. And also, the number one application in Facebook is a virtual world, right? Facebook, uh, 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 Farmville, Frontierville, Yoville. I mean, there's zillions of, I mean, Zynga is making their money doing simple, easy to use virtual worlds inside of Facebook and other platforms. So Facebook can have virtual worlds inside of it. And like the, that kind of, uh, of the, the green dot thing is absolutely starting to get virtual worldy. It's definitely starting to take that, that, that look. But I wouldn't want to say that a social network kind of thing like MySpace or Facebook is in and of itself a virtual world. They can share logics, but we really lose something if we say that everything is the same and there's no difference. We need to be able to make those distinctions while looking at similarities like you friend people in Facebook, you friend people in Second Life. So I, my answer would be that Facebook has places inside of it. And the group chat thing, I'm watching that. I think that's a fascinating example. Well, I, for me as an anthropologist, that's an emit question. So I would want to ask people that and see when they start thinking of it. Because from the early work on MUDs, there's a lot of interesting early work on what the people would call textual avatars. And what a textual avatar was, was typically a verbal description of someone, where you'd say, I'm five foot five, I have green skin, I have wings, that kind of thing. So there's actually a lot of interesting work on textual avatars. And even like fancy looking virtual worlds like Second Life or Blue Mars, text is very important to them. So is the green dot a body? I want to ask that to people once I have time to have a research life again. And that's a great question. I think it's fascinating. That's an awesome question. Oh, last thing, very quickly. Um, yes, you can have, in, in Second Life, most human um, embodiments end up being in some way humanoid or at least individualistic in that way. But there are all, all kinds of other possibilities. So EVE Online is another great example. Where on EVE Online, your body is actually a ship. And you can't actually be inside the ship because your, your body is the ship, basically. And that goes back to asteroids right, and space invaders, where your virtual body actually is a ship. That's not new as well. And that raises other kinds of interesting possibilities. And so once again, you know, all researchers and all, at least all anthropologists, we research narrowly and think broadly. And so I'm focused on Second Life, where that, you can sort of be a ship, but it's hard to do in Second Life. Um, but that raises really interesting questions. And I know some people who are doing research on EVE Online right now um, around some of these issues. So it's a fascinating uh, issue, definitely. you also for your talk. Um, so my question also has a little bit to do with um, the haptic. Um, with purse, the notion of the index, you pointed primarily to the dyctic, right, the shifter. But there's also the notion that, you know, for example, we always talk about in photography in terms of the contact, the physical trace. So I just wondered how <laughs> you could think in terms of that gap, in terms of, you know, the, the index as something that has a physical relation. Does that become actually the digit that is on the mouse? I mean, how do you then talk about the fact that there's a body that controls whatever physical interface there is <clears throat> to actually make the, the Second Life character move? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's an awesome question. I've, I've, I still haven't thought it through as much as I'd like to because I have no time. But for, for Purse, the, what you're talking about, for him, is, it is physical because he's only thinking about the physical world. But the key thing in that idea of index is that it's causal, right? So the notion that smoke from a fire is an index of the fire or that a hole in a piece of metal is an index of the bullet used to fire at the piece of metal are some of the classic examples used. And there, the pointing relationship is predicated on a, on a causal relationship, which is a 
really right, which is that piece of it. And so in this case, when I'm talking about the recursive indexicality, there's the causality thing that you are creating and making stuff inside of Second Life, like when I was making, you know, making stuff inside of it. So to me, it has to do with questions of causality is an interesting place where I would like to think through more that idea of indexical relationship. Because it, you're right, it's not just about the non, that sort of non-semiotic um, uh, shifter, you know, in Silverstein or Jakobson's terms, but also part of that shifting is about a causal relationship. And so how does that causality work, especially with techne and this emphasis on crafting that I see so much is a really interesting issue. And I, I wish I had thought it through more than that, but in a year and a half, I'll get to think it through more than that. But you're right, it's a fascinating issue. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I wonder if you might uh, reflect a little bit on the question of metaphors and particularly metaphors in our interaction with the digital. So your, your laptop has folders, but those are just sort of metaphors for a real world mm -hmm. kind of way of organizing information. Um, and how much of these places are really places as much as they are metaphors for places? That's certainly residents of Second Life really adopt that metaphor and talk about my home and my land and my place. Um, and is there a difference or a theoretical implications for that? Yeah, now that's a great question. And I was, before, an anthro before as an anthropologist, I was a, a student of George Lakoff's at Berkeley. So I think about metaphor a lot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And obviously, in the radio interview this morning, I was talking about how with computers, we, you know, we have a garbage can, I have a folder to put my document, I have a desktop, right? We, we're always importing metaphors from things that are more familiar to things that are less familiar, and that's, that's the, been, always been the case throughout the history of technology that was happening with the telegraph. Um, and it's definitely happening with virtual worlds as well. Um, but not everything is a metaphor in that sense. So to me, a virtu the, the placeness of a virtual world is not simply a metaphor because that is a, a place in the sense that you're having some new kind of synchronic and asynchronic social interaction happening in that place that isn't predicated on having to meet those people in the physical world or that kind of thing. So I don't want to say more than just metaphor because as a Lakoff student, I know metaphors are, are real, right? I would never oppose the metaphorical to the real. And the places, to me, what makes it confusing, I, I would say that it's not metaphorical, the sense of a place in Second Life, but it's so chock full of metaphors, it's very confusing because there's a green, there's a blue sky, there's green grass, there's water that flows downhill, there's walls. I mean, there's so many metaphors. It's just a wash in metaphors. But I, would, but I wouldn't reduce it to just those metaphors because metaphors are often used as conceptual handles to better understand an X. And the X is more than just the metaphor. There's more to computers than just trash cans and, fi and desktops. Even though we're using those metaphors to understand our interactions with computers, the computer is not reducible to those metaphors, if you see what I say. Saying, although of course those metaphors shape the way that people interact with computers. They think about a garbage can or a recycle bin in a particular way based partially on people's physical world experience with, with garbage cans. So metaphors do have um, consequences to be sure, but I wouldn't want to just say that virtual worlds are just nothing but a metaphorical projection of, of a physical world that's, that's real. That's why like in my book and everything I do, I never say real world versus virtual world. I say real versus actual, following Deleuze or, or, or real versus physical, uh, virtual versus physical or virtual versus actual. Because as one scholar put it, we don't want to imagine a real world that's computer free. I mean, the real, the, it is real, absolutely. Um, and that's then what's so interesting is what does real mean? Hi, <clears throat> thank you for your uh, very interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering whether you uh, maintain a very sharp distinction or how you maintain a distinction between virtual worlds and virtual reality. Um, oh, yeah. and since, since you brought up MUDs and, and text-based um, virtual worlds, I'm curious about the distinction between that and maybe how you would think of place in uh, sci-fi examples like the holodeck. Yeah, yeah, yeah your body goes in. Right, and the VR stuff. Now that's a great question. It's been a point of confusion to a lot of people, and I, I talk about this in the book quite a bit, actually. So virtual reality, VR stuff, <clears throat> like Jared Lanier and all those folks, originally meant sort of um, uh, where like the, you know, you've seen like the goggle thing like people use in flight simulations where you think you're in another place, and it's about this kind of total sensory immersion, right? In fact, the movie Avatar is about, about a kind of virtual reality kind of thing. And what, what's so interesting in the last 10 or 15 years is how that virtual reality stuff has sort of fallen by the wayside 
even though stuff like the Microsoft Connect is bringing it back in a sort of interesting way. Because what people have realized, and Ed, um, Ted Castronova and other people have written about this in a, really, in a very interesting way, is that people are more interested in social immersion than sensory immersion. So that people are actually quite happy to just be on a desktop and look at Second Life or World of Warcraft if the social relationships that they're having with people, they feel those are real. They don't need it to be in surround sound and full 365 kind of thing. So there was a time, you know, not that long ago in the 80s and 90s when people thought that's where everything was going was sort of full immersion, like the Matrix movie kind of thing. And it turns out what people care a lot more about is social immersion. And that kind of virtual reality stuff has become a much more minor player. And it really shows up in very, nowadays, only in sort of very specific things. So it's used like in military and flight simulation, where you train people and there you want it to be very realistic. Or nowadays they're doing some kinds of medical training things online, or using these technologies in the physical world where they want um, things to be as realistic as possible. So even something like Second Life for Blue Mars, where it looks realistic in the sense of the, the you know, it's all very pretty visually, there's not much demand out there for people to have it be like in a full immersion kind of thing. So it's been interesting the way in which that's a path not taken to a sense, that there was a point in time when people thought that's where it was going and it veered off. It didn't go that way. And instead it went much more towards social immersion and social interaction. So it's a, it's a great question. It'll be interesting to see what happens now Part of the thing around that also was well, a lack of interest, which is very interesting theoretically, but also how expensive those technologies were. And now that you're getting things like the Wii and the Microsoft Connect and other kinds of things that allow new kinds of haptic interaction, will there be more interest, like even the 3D you know, glasses or stuff like that? I, I don't know. But so far, the demand is not, the interest in that worldwide has not been as big as people used to think it would be. They used to conflate virtual worlds with being fully immersed in terms of your senses, and that has not been the way things have gone. Again, thank you so much for that talk. It was fascinating. I just um, have like, well, I really look forward to seeing how this idea of embodiment and emplacement is going to be challenging. Idea like the the field itself, eth ethnography, creating a world, creates. I mean, that's amazing. Instead of inserting yourself into an already pre-existing world, but um, my question has to do with the idea of borders. So I'm coming from like the humanities, where we where we were kind of obsessed with borders. Um, how it allows for certain things to happen. So I'm wondering, you were talking about these worlds allow for uh, multiple places to exist at once, as well as people from different parts of the world to be in the same place. And I was just wondering, is, this, is it gonna be just a celebratory observation of how borders are becoming obsolete in a sense? I was just wondering if you could maybe comment on that concept. <coughs> sure, well, two points on that. First. I never, I mean, as Martin, I think, mentioned, my first two books are on gay Indonesians, and I still, I was in Indonesia a couple months ago, and I, I still do that research. And I continue to be surprised by how many things are common between the two research projects. I really designed the Second Life project to be as different as I could make it. I wanted to try something really different. And, you know, in Indonesia, I, when I would hang out with gay guys and women, but for a moment taking the gay guy sociality, like in, certain, in Java and Bali, men would take these certain parts of a park at night and they'd be hanging out, and this, this particular one, like names for them, I'm not kidding, are places like Texas. There's one called Califor for California. There's one called Brasil. And they had the sort of imagined geography um, that overlaid the city of Surabaya. That was a gay space, a queer space. And that people would actually say, I'm not at this park right now, I'm in Texas. And Texas is a place but made into a new place because of those gay bodies and that gay social interaction happening there. And they, people would say, would say, in a sense, it's not there during the daytime. It comes into being when we go there. And so the idea that embodiment creates place, that's one reason why I'm so interested in the notion of Cora, is I don't think is new to virtual worlds. I think virtual worlds like throw it in your face, but I think it's actually there elsewhere. So I, I, that's something that is just so interesting to me in, in terms of my projects. 
Now, in terms of creating new borders, virtual worlds allow for creating new kinds of barriers and borders or opening them. I mean, they're completely neutral. And in many of these virtual worlds, like Second Life, you can allow the land you're on that only certain people can access. And there's a lot of closed off places in Second Life, including places where the US military is using Second Life. Just like on Facebook, you can only, you know, you can block people, you can choose to not friend them, or you can defriend them. Um, or one of the new verbs I learned from my undergraduates in the spring, I had a couple undergraduates do research search on them, um, chat roulette, if you don't know what that is, but um, you know, Facebook and these other, Facebook and Second Life and gave us this new verb of friending, right? And friend has now become a verb, but in, in, in chat roulette, if you see someone and you don't like them or you don't like looking at their penis, whatever it is that they're doing, you next them. And so there's nexting happens in chat roulette. So next is now a new kind of verb. And nexting is a kind of border making as well. And so you can definitely have new forms of borders. It really depends on what we do with them. And something I mentioned in the book and elsewhere is a real area for concern is that you can have a virtual world like Second Life that is nonprofit or jointly controlled by the participants. In fact, there's these experiments called Open Sim, where they basically reverse engineered the Second Life program to create sort of public areas. But almost all of the virtual worlds, including all of the big ones and all of the ones for children, are run by for-profit corporations. And those corporations have power inside of those places that, you know, Indonesia, where I've spent so much time, the former dictator Suharto could never have dreamed, you know, as I mentioned in my radio interview earlier, you know, Suharto could, you know, ban homosexuality if he wanted to or do this or do that, but he couldn't get up one morning and say, you know, I think I want gravity to pull upward today. You know, or I think I want um, <clears throat> people to, you know, have blue grass instead of green grass. Or in Second Life, you can make groups to, like, group people with friends. And originally, the limit was five. And then it changed to 15, and then it changed to 25. And part of that was about the technology. But then they could take it back to five if they felt like it. The only risk would be, would so many people leave, that it would become unprofitable. But in theory, the controllers and owners of virtual worlds have power over the sociality. And I, I've asked, you know, in my book and elsewhere, what does it mean, for instance, on something like, like uh, in many of these places, that you can friend people, but there's no category of best friend, um, you know, that there's only one kind of friend. You know, what does it mean that in Second Life, you can have a partner who's male or female, homosexuality is allowed, but you can only have one, so polygamy is not allowed. Um, what does, what are, and I talk about this as the relationship between platform and social form. How does the platform shape the social form? And it doesn't do it in a determin deterministic sense, like we're robots, but it definitely has influence. And this issue of borders is just one piece of a broader issue of the relationship between platform and social form that I think we need to be very vigilant about, especially because some of these so many of these virtual worlds are for kids, and they have a level of control that is way beyond Second Life. Second Life is very open-ended. They really chaperone those, those kids' virtual worlds, and what they allow kids to do and not do, I think we really need to think about, um, because there's things about that that can be very problematic. Maybe one more question. And then I can stay afterwards if people want to ask me stuff one-on-one -on -one as well. I'm, I'm a little conflicted about your statement saying that Facebook and Twitter could have existed in, in these previous um, moments in technological history. And, and, par and so I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about it. And what I have in mind is the way that you account for how these spaces are in part a product of who populates them and who is able to populate them. Uh, because there's part of what makes Facebook Facebook is who gets to populate it, and it's especially important given its history of being limited at first to Ivy Leagues and then college users and then general users. Yeah, no, I, that's, not, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean that it couldn't have, have happened or the way that you're saying it. I mean that, th that it has to do with precisely the kind of social history that you're, not, that you're talking about, not a kind of technological determinism that it couldn't have appeared earlier. Because the technology is real. Like, Second Life could not have happened in 1996. You can't do Second Life without broadband and a pretty good graphics chip. Like, my fairly new Mac like, is like going, the fan when I'm doing Second Life, because the graphics chip is like, oh, let me rest, right? Whereas, so, so there, there is a certain kind of technological determinism in the sense that you could not have had Second Life in 1950 or 1970 or even 1990 or even 1995. You really need broadband access and a, and a certain kind of computer to be able to do it. And I, I'm trying to make precisely the point that you're making, that with social networking sites, for that's a case where 
it was not technology narrowly conceived. Just like, you know, we could have had eBay or Google or many of these things earlier from a raw technology point of view, but what was at stake was precisely what you're talking about, forms of sociality, including forms of social exclusion and prioritizing that allowed, and allowed the kind of inventiveness for these worlds to come into being. And that, I simply use that as an object lesson that we don't want to talk about what virtual worlds might be and what their impact might be based solely on what they are right now, based solely on World of Warcraft and Second Life and Habba Hotel and EVE Online or whatever, that there, there are incredibly interesting or dangerous or exciting or creepy or whatever uses of virtual worlds possible that we just can't even imagine right now. Um, and it's not simply a matter of technology, and that's why, as a social scientist, it's interesting to me to track what those socialities are. So I'm in complete agreement with you. It's, it's the exact point that it's not a sort of technological determinist point, but it's precisely about those precise histories. And you know, I don't know if you know Dana Boyd's White Flight from Network Public's piece, or you know, other people have done really interesting work on this question of what, I'm call, what I call platform versus social form, that the way in which Facebook was created has a legacy effect even now, and in my book, I talk about this California ideology and the fact that even though Second Life Now is very transnational, the fact that it was created in California and is still, the company is still based there has all kinds of consequences. You know, as my colleague Celia Pierce says, Pacific Standard Time is the new Greenwich Mean Time of virtual worlds and online games, right? And there's a reason why, you know, in Second Life, everything is based on Pacific Standard Time. There's a history there, and so you're absolutely right. Those legacy effects, once again, it's not a deterministic thing where the past simply determines the present, obviously, but nor is it something where it has no effect at all. And that's why I think, you know, in my, in my book, that one of the first chapters I do is history. I think looking at the history of this work, and there is amazing work done and still being done on MUDs and the early text-based virtual worlds. Um, you know, Laurie Kendall, who's here, Pavel Curtis, a whole bunch of people did fascinating work on that stuff that is still completely relevant and, and I've learned so much from. So I, I'm in total agreement with your point. Thank you.